I chose uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 to 3. I come back to this section of scripture quite a bit, and for good reason tonight. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 through 3 speaks about the transitory nature of our life in Christ Jesus. We are not putting our roots down in this world. We are actually leaving this place and going to another, which is the reason why I chose this text is because here we are coming to the end of 2013 and we're getting ready to go right into 2014. And so we see a lot of the traits of our pilgrimage in this Christian life in the attributes of time. For example, time is continuously moving. Even as I'm speaking, seconds have gone by. Seconds will continue to go by. We are closing in on the end of this year and moving into the next. Time is always on the move. I only know of one place in the scripture where time says still. So that a battle could be fought. But other than that, time continues to progress forward. And that's another thing about our life. It's always in a forward motion, never in a backwards motion. And that's the way time is, see? And so I felt this would be very appropriate to come to this text in Hebrews chapter 12 and to affirm our strangership here in this world. Okay. Hebrews 12, 1 to 3 says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin with Dutch so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. I just want to draw out this one aspect. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. I think we'll understand the nature of this race better if we understand the us and the we that comes up so often in this section of scripture, okay? We also are compassed about, let us lay aside the sin which does so easily beset us. Let us run the race set before us. And of course, the author and finisher of our faith, who is the us and who are the we? They are the runners in the race. That's who they are. But I want to know what got them into the race in the first place. In order to find that, we go back to the beginning of the 11th chapter, in which the apostle defines faith. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Faith is to us our, our spiritual sensory. It is the means by which we perceive what cannot be perceived any other way. The scripture says that we walk by faith, not by sight. And so how we walk in spiritual life, we walk through this, what you might call a spiritual sensory of faith. What we perceive determines the direction in which we live. Everybody is in motion. Every man is either moving away from God or toward God. Every man is either moving closer to hell or closer to heaven. Every man is moving closer to what is unseen or further from what is unseen and closer to what is seen. That's the way it is. Everybody is in motion. Nobody is static. These runners are running toward what is unseen, toward what is heavenly, and toward the living God. That's, that's where they are running. Now, in Hebrews chapter 11, we see a number of what we might call acts of faith. This is called the hall of faith because there are so many marvelous and admirable things that are done by people that walk by faith just to show us the impact that faith has in the life of a believer. See, it does not just, it doesn't just change what we talk about. It changes what we do. It changes everything about us. For example, Abel. He offered a better sacrifice than Cain. He did that by faith. Yeah. That term comes up over and over. Enoch, Enoch had a good report, not from men, but from God. Amen. And he walked with God. And he was translated by faith. That's what the scripture says. He was translated so that we saw him no more. That's quite a thing. He was the only man who did that. Noah, as you know, by faith, Noah moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. See? See, all of these things, and you'll see in all these things, all these men were moved by something they couldn't see. We don't know anything about rain during that time, but no one knew it was coming. God said it was coming. Abraham, he was a sojourner in the land that God had promised him. 
with Isaac and Jacob. They were all sojourners Amen. in the land of promise. What a marvelous thing that is. And you know of the many marvelous things that Abraham did by faith. Sarah received strength so that she could conceive seed. She received it from the Lord. She received it from the Lord. I love to think about Jacob. You know, the scripture says of Jacob, by faith, he worshiped, leaning on the top of his staff. So here, here is Jacob at the end of his life, and he still has the expectation he had when God called him in the first place. That's, that's quite a testimony. And Moses, as you know, by faith, Moses, Moses endured. That's what he did. He endured in Egypt. He endured when Pharaoh chased after him. He didn't fear the wrath of the king. See, and all of these, all of these brethren had these marvelous things that they did, and we could go on and on about this. But with all the diverse things that godly people did throughout this chapter of Hebrews chapter 11, we see one thing in common with all of them. Every one of them, by faith, were uprooted from this world. And it's by the expectation of another world that they did what they did. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13 through 16. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. And were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And you may recall what kind of country that was. It was a heavenly one. They had plenty of opportunity if they wanted to to go back, but none of these went back. None of them. And their lives declared plainly. Let me ask you. Let me ask you. Does your life declare plainly? That came to me as I've been looking over this last week. Does your life, do you declare plainly that you're seeking another country? Is it obvious? You know, some people, it's not obvious. You really are not for sure. You really can't tell a whole lot of difference. These people didn't walk like everybody walked. Amen. They walked like citizens of heaven on the earth. Amen. Yeah. They were strangers and pilgrims while they were here. Their faith made them that way. Okay? Now, the scripture says this. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Now, Hebrews chapter 11 is a commentary on what it means to overcome the world. All of these brethren resisted that, that vortex of desire that draws men by earthly lusts and desires into earthly ambitions and drowns them in perdition. Yeah. But every one of these brethren got out of that tide. Yeah. They didn't follow the course of this world, according to Ephesians chapter 2. They broke from that course by faith. And we're moving upstream in a different direction because of a longing for heaven. Now that's where the us is. It was the us of them and it's the us of us. We all are moved by the same motive, maybe doing different things, but all moved by the same motive. We too are looking for a heavenly country. We are, God has made us that way. And so we were running a very peculiar race. Ours is not a horizontal race, ours is a vertical race. With our pace, we are actually making distance between us and the earth and closing in on heaven's gates. Amen. It's a marvelous race that we're in. And we're all being driven by a preoccupied affection for heavenly things. Think, my brethren, of the things that we know. Think of what little these brethren knew, and yet they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. But think of how much more we know since we live in the day in the time when the true light now shines, things that are heavenly. For one, our citizenship is in heaven. From whence we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who's going to change our body that it may be likened unto his glorious body. We're looking forward to that. Aren't you looking forward to that new body? Amen. This body doesn't agree with our pilgrimage, but that's okay. Your body's like a daily commentary that you're a stranger here. That's, that's what it is. Our citizenship is in heaven. More than that... God is our Father, which art in heaven. Isn't that what Jesus said? You know, when Jesus rose from the grave, before Jesus rose from the grave, his most common reference to the Father was either the Father or my Father. But when he rose from the grave, he told Mary, go and tell 
Go and tell my disciples, my God, your God, my Father, your Father. Remember him saying that? He's our Heavenly Father. It's our Heavenly Father. Think of this. We have access to every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. All of our advantages are above us. Amen. No wonder our affection is set on things that are above. Think of this. We are partakers of a heavenly calling. We are tasting of the heavenly gift. We are come to the heavenly Jerusalem. To the Jerusalem which is above is the one that is the mother of us all. We speak about the world to come. See, the Lord will preserve us unto his heavenly kingdom. And our reward in heaven is great, Jesus said. You may recall. We shall bear the image of the heavenly, which is already beginning. And one day we shall be like him and we shall be with him where he is. And where is that? He's with the Father at the right hand. Brethren, it is these things that has determined the course in which we are running. See, faith has made us more aware of what's above us than what's below us. And we're running with those things in mind. You see, we are, in fact, a people on the move, just like in any race. That's what a race is. People are running from one place to another, and they're always on the move, and that's what we are. We are a people on the move. We are part of this advancing kingdom. And if you're going to be part of a kingdom that's advancing, you're going to have to be moving to keep up with it. Amen. We know, brethren, that from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing. Amen. And forceful men, I like that, the NIV, I just, I like that. Forceful men lay hold on it. It's like a kingdom that's on the move. And if you're going to get into it, you've got to lay hold on it. Amen. See? <coughs> Amen. When I first started... At trash work in Republic Services, one of the ways they initiate you to make sure that you, you can, like, handle it is they tend to kind of push you as hard as they can. I, I didn't know it was quite like this until I got with somebody who was doing this. Well, maybe it was just him doing it to me. I don't know. Maybe the other guys didn't do this, but this guy did it to me. And uh, you know the traditional trash truck, the guy, there's a guy in the back and there's a guy driving in the front. And uh, typically, if you're a new guy, you're not going to be driving the truck because you don't know where you're going. So they put you on the back. Well, this guy thought it would be good to test me by just keeping that truck rolling. And so as soon as I dumped my last can and it was time to move on to the next one, he was already moving the truck. If I was going to keep up with that truck, I had to lay hold on that truck as fast as I could and get a firm grip because it was in, in moving. It was moving. There were a few times where I didn't actually get a hold of it. I actually went for the step and it was already... That's the kind of kingdom we're a part of, brethren. See, if you're going to keep up with the kingdom, you've got to keep moving. Amen. See, we don't want to be like those Israelites yeah. that were straggling back. See, when God was on the move, no wonder you had to have light tackle Amen. in the wilderness. Amen. Huh? God didn't say, we're going to move moving in a day. Everybody get ready. No, when God was, you've got that. He started moving. You better get moving. Amen. Brother, and that's the race that we are in. We are in a kingdom that is forcefully advancing because the government is on his shoulders and the increase of his kingdom never ends. We increase in order to stay a part of it. <laughs> That's just the way it is. Aren't you glad he's laid hold on you? Thank God for that. I, I love this kingdom. I'm thankful for it. Now, 1 Peter 2, chapter 11, we're talking about being on the move. In other words, we're pilgrims in the earth. We don't put down roots here. Huh? Our tackle is very light. Yeah. Our bodies are tense. That's, I love all these marvelous images in the scriptures. Peter said, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. Amen. You remember when Israel, things be, began to be very difficult there in the wilderness. And unfortunately, when, you, when things become difficult and you become fatigued along the way, if you're not careful, yeah. you're tempted to complain. Yeah. And remember the mixed multitude that came with them began to be envious of that Egyptian diet they had. And unfortunately, their complaint bled over into Israel and Israel began to complain. Mm. And that mixed multitude said, all we have is this manna. They called it this manna. Well, you know what God did as a result, right? Remember? He said, okay, you want meat? I'll give you meat. 
and quail fell to the ground three foot high a day's direction in both directions for those people. And when they threw themselves upon that meat and it was yet in their nostrils, God's wrath was kindled against them. It's not because Egyptian diet is wicked and evil of itself. It's that they were murmuring and they wanted something that was going to make it difficult for them to keep on the move. Yes, that's right. Israel did the same thing later. We load this light bread. It was light for a reason. Now, anytime, anytime Satan tempts you, this is very helpful. All temptation, brethren, is an attempt by Satan to put weights on you. And fleshly lust is always a lust after a weight. The more a person lusts for that thing, the slower they become in the race. You see, we're people on the move. There are things that we have to abstain from because those things slow us down. We can't have anything slow us, slowing us down in this race. We intend on getting glory. And if you're going to do that, you're going to have to strip down. We've heard it said one time that, you know what God is doing? He's like pulling us through a knot hole to take us to glory. But in the midst of the pool, everything that can't get there is coming off. Amen. It's coming off. Thank God for that. It's astounding the kind of fleshly lusts that have disqualified men for the great blessing of God. Achan, right there at the breadth of the land of Canaan. And he dies because he coveted what was in Jericho. It's an astounding thing. Judas sold out Jesus for a servant's hire for 30 pieces of silver. He had Jesus right there, and he was an apostle, and he sold him out. Why? Fleshly lust. They weighed him down. Couldn't finish the race. Demas did the same thing. There he was laboring together with Paul. What a, what a marvelous thing that would be to be a laborer together with Paul. Here he was. What did he do? He forsook him, left the work. Why? He didn't abstain from these fleshly lusts, and they, became, they were like a weight on him, and he couldn't finish the race. So I beseech you, brethren, just like Peter did, because you are pilgrims and strangers on the move, abstain from those weighty lusts. They war against your soul. Now, we are on the move, but now we're on the move through quite a race here. He says that we are to run with endurance. Run with endurance or patience the race that is set before us. Running requires endurance. In fact, God built endurance into running itself, physical running. Anybody ever run for just like just a little bit? You'll, you'll know right away. You start to huff and puff and the muscles begin to ache. God put difficulty into running because that's a part of the race, right? Huh? In fact, if you look at it the right way, as long as you are suffering for righteousness sake, I understand you can bring difficulty on yourself. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the difficulty associated with being in the right race, running in the right direction for the right reason. You want to go to heaven and you're motivated by faith. Your difficulty will actually be a commentary that you're running. You're running. Don't be discouraged because of the difficulty. I'll give you reasons why. But we do have to run with endurance. See, our race isn't that nice, smooth track that we see at the Olympics. It is more like, it's more like an obstacle course. It is. There are obstructions that you cannot go around in order to make it home. There are difficulties you have to go through because they are on the race track. Okay? They are on the track. Jesus had to endure the cross, despising the shame before he could set down at the right hand of God because that was en route to glory. Abel had to confront Cain before he could make it home to glory. Noah had to confront the entire world. Thank God for 52 people in this room who can encourage you. Noah didn't have that. The earth was filled with violence when he was devoted to serving the living God. He didn't have anybody. That was an obstacle. Yes. Went right through it. Went right through it, brethren. Jacob had to confront Esau. 
before he could finish his race. Mo Moses had to confront Egypt before he could finish his race. David had to confront Goliath. Paul had to confront Alexander and the Jews. Jesus had to confront the cross. And you've got things you have to confront. You can't go around it. You've got to go right through it. Amen. There are days when it becomes very apparent that we have the same experience that we find in the psalmist. By thee have I run through a troop, through a troop, and by my God have I leaped over a wall. We're not going around it. We're going right through it. Why? Because it's on the track. It's on the track. Brethren, if you're going to get home, you've got to stay on the track. We do not give prizes to people that get off the track and run across the middle and get on the other side and run around to the finish line. We don't give people prizes. In fact, Olympics, if they actually step on the line, they're out. This is just disqualified. That's just the way it is. You got to run the course. You got to stay on the course. If a man also strives for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. And the law of the Lord is... Stay on the track. Run with endurance the race set before you. Beware of Christian shortcut. Remember when they got out of the river? Here's Christian hopeful. They're going along. But see, the way was difficult for them. It began to be difficult. Their feet were hurting, and they saw this meadow. The problem was is the meadow wasn't connected to the track, was it? They had to jump the fence, didn't they? In other words, they had to get off the path in order to get into the meadow. But my, how their feet felt so good as they went through that meadow. But it wasn't very long, and it began to be dark, and then it began to rain, and then came the floods, and then Christian began to regret that he'd gotten off the track. And you know the difficulties that continued on, brethren. You know it's actually easier to stay on the track than it is to get off. The way of the transgressor is hard. Do not seek the convenient road, my brethren. If you've ever gotten off the track, maybe you heard that quote that was found in that marvelous Pilgrim's Progress, set thine heart toward the highway, even the way which thou wentest, turn again. You got to go back and get back on where you got off. God has determined the course for every single one of us. And if you're going to be what God has called you to be by the time you get to heaven, you've got to stay on the course. Yeah, that's right. Stay on the course, even if it means going through some very, very difficult things. Hear the words of our master who's called us into the race himself, saying, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. Do not choose the convenient way. We're not saying call trouble to yourself. We're not saying that. You just walk by faith, and God will determine the trouble you got to go through to get home. I'm glad he makes that determination. I'm... You know, I can go through it if he's the one determining it, right? Why do we need endurance? For more than this, more than just that there's obstacles, but because the race is more like a marathon than a 50-yard dash. I think it would be kind of easy, you know, as Brother Given has said, it would be kind of easy, you know, if you're right out of the baptismal waters before you've even dried off, someone just kill you right there. But God wouldn't get glory out of the 50-yard dash. He gets glory out of the marathon. He gets glory when Noah is faithful for 120 years. He gets glory when Moses is faithful for 40 years in the wilderness with those complaining Israelites. He gets glory out of that, brethren. Amen. He gets glory out of the long road. Some brethren, some brethren go home quickly. I understand that. But that is not the general rule. The general rule is run the marathon. Run the marathon. Ye have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. You know, a lot of times when people think about the will of God, they're thinking about one particular thing at one particular time. But that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about your entire life. The entire conversation and communication of your life being doing the will of God. You have need of patience until the will of God is done. It will require your entire life to get that done. It will. He that endureth to the end. We're talking about endurance in the race. He that endureth to the end shall be saved. The point is this. You've got to keep running until you get home. Yes. Mm -hmm. Amen. 
until you've left foreign soil and are in heaven, you're going to have to run. Yeah. And, and we want to run. It's not, I'm not saying we want to run. Amen. We're glad for this. 1 Corinthians 9.24 says it this way, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that you may obtain. Finish the race, brethren. There's no door prizes for second place in this race, and nobody gets anything good from God that doesn't finish. The quitter doesn't get anything. We're going to keep running until we hit that tape. We are. We're running until we get to the prize. And when is the end? As we've said before, you have kind of two views of it, and I'm glad for this. Either you die or Jesus comes, one or the other. I mean, three score and ten. If by virtue of strength, you may have some more years than that, but other than that, you're home free. You're at the end of your race. Or Jesus comes again. I like what Paul told Timothy. He said, keep the commandment without spot until the appearing. Amen. I like that idea. I like that idea. That would be my wish for all of us, that, that kind of thing, that Jesus would just come and cut the work short of righteousness and come, and none of us would have to die. It would just be instant. And at that time, your race would be done. Aren't you glad this race has a finish line? Yeah. What if it didn't? Yeah. What if it didn't have a finish line? Well, we'd be discouraged right out of the onset. No, there's a finish line. In fact, as we come to the close of this year and we're going to move into the next year, it is a reminder that we are progressing that much closer to the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. See? It's, it's a marvelous thing. I'm glad it's that way, brother. We are not wilderness wanderers. We're not. We're, rocking, we're, we're walking on a straight course or running with our text on a straight course toward glory. And now is your salvation nearer than when you first believed. At the end of this year, you are closer to the end of your race than you were at the beginning of last year. I'm thankful for that. I'm glad, I'm glad there's a finish line. Glad there is. But now this race requires focus. This will be my last point tonight. Let us run looking unto Jesus. We are running and looking at the same time. Right. <coughs> running and looking. How are we enduring? We are enduring the same way Moses endured, by seeing him that is invisible. We are running and seeing him that is invisible. See? We are doing exactly what Peter did when he stepped out of the boat and essayed to go to Jesus. While he was on the move to go to Jesus... He was looking to Jesus. The only difficulty Moses had, or oh, sorry, Moses, the only difficulty Peter had is when he turned away. That's what all temptation's about. That's right. It's all about getting your eyes off Jesus. That's what it's all about. That's what those wind and waves were all about. That's why we have to have grace from God not to look to our trouble when we're in it. Amen. I'm the first one to say I, there is a great need for grace in this area. I think sometimes we put more trouble on ourselves than we need to. You don't get weight by looking to Jesus. That's right. yeah. What's the purpose of looking to Jesus? Because Jesus is going to see to it that you're light on your feet while you're running this race. Amen. Amen. Didn't he say that? Mm -hmm. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I'll tell you, if you're running without looking at Jesus in this race, it's a hard running. Yeah. Maybe you've seen some people running. Something's caught their attention, turned them aside, and you can see their head dipping. Something's turned them away from Jesus. I'm not saying be critical of, of that kind of thing, but Jesus doesn't put, <laughs> Jesus doesn't make the race harder when you're looking at him. Amen. He doesn't do that. He really meant what he said. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Hmm. Let me explain this to you. You're right, Brother Given. This, when you really think about Jesus and preach Christ from the specific text that you're looking at, this can be very difficult because there is so much to see in Christ. There is so much there to see. It's astounding. But, you know, um, there's a couple of things that I've seen more clearly in Christ and that have been proven in my own experience that have been very helpful. One thing is this. Jesus can give you a joy that cannot be put out by difficult things. He can do this. 
He can do this. Now think about this. He said in, uh, let, me find, let me find my bearings here real quick. Just a sec. John chapter 16, verse 22. Remember, he's about to leave the world, and he's telling his disciples all these things, and the burden is getting heavier on them because they love Jesus. They didn't want to see him go. You wouldn't have either if you had been there with what little you would have known like they knew. And so they were burdened by the heaviness of the whole thing. And so Jesus told them, you now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again. And your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. Now, brethren, I don't think the need is for us to lighten the load. I think the need is for us to fuel the affection. I think that's the need. Because I'm telling you, when you're looking to Jesus, you receive from Christ an affection in your heart that is able to match any difficulty you go through. How can the disciples be beat? And count it all joy. How can they do this? I mean, how can Paul and Silas be at the midnight hour, which is the hardest hour if you're sick or your body is broken? The, it's like the hardest hour to bear up under difficulty. And they're singing hymns in a prison of all places. How can they do that? Because Jesus can give you a joy that no man can take from you. Now, you can give your joy to any man walking down the street. But they can't take it from you. What are you looking at? See, if you're looking at Christ, there is always enough incentive to keep the fire of your joy bright. And although you may go through some very difficult things, but if you'll reach down deep within your spirit and think about what you know about Christ, there's joy there. It's a joy to serve God. It doesn't mean you're never in difficulties, but the fire never goes out. I'm reminded of, of what Christian saw. Remember when he went into that enchanted castle, and one of the things that he saw was the fire that was on the wall, and there was a man there going, psh, psh, putting water on that fire, and the fire never went out. Well, how in the world can this be? And he looked behind the wall and found a man with an oil can, oil in the fire. Now, that's what this joy is like. Jesus can do that. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing so that you may bound in hope through the power of the Spirit. How did Jesus endure his race? The joy set before him. And if you will look to Christ, he will show you that joy that was set before him. And if it can bring Jesus through a much greater difficulty than you will ever face, I can assure you it will bring you right through. I'll tell you, if we could put Jesus' difficulties on the scale and zero it out and put the difficulties of every human being that's ever walked the face of the earth on the other side, it wouldn't even tip the scale. But for the joy that's set before him, he endured the cross. And when you look at him, he shares that joy with you. Haven't you found it to be so? Maybe weeping has endured for the night. Maybe you have been in that waiting period that God puts us in at times where we seem to have so little strength and we're scrapping to keep the ground we have and pretty soon light breaks and joy comes in the morning. You know, when I'm on route in these commercial routes that I do, the most difficult time is right before the sun comes up. That is the most difficult time to stay awake. It's like a picture of what life is in Christ. So you've had some dark times. It was difficult. It was difficult to stay awake. But if you kept your trust in the Lord, when you needed the strength yeah. Yeah. to stay in the race, you know you got it, didn't you? You got it. Young ones, ask some of these older ones. They've been through a lot more difficulties than you've been through. Ask them about the faithfulness of God. He knows you're waiting on him. His glory is at stake when it comes to you finishing this race. Or let me say it another way. He gets more glory out of you finishing the race than you quitting. You say, is God really interested in the level of our joy? Not that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy. You bet he does because the joy of the Lord is your strength. And he'll give you joy so you can bear up. But there's one more thing I want to I give to you and then I'll be done here. That's meant so much to me. When you look at Jesus, and of course you have someone that's preached the truth about Christ to you, so you see it very clearly, is you see a king. Not just a king, but the king of kings. If 
before he left the world, he told his disciples to encourage their hearts to go out into all the world, all power in heaven and earth has been given to me. Every bit of it, which means what? Everything that's going on in this world has been orchestrated by Jesus himself. Every bit of it. To say it in the terminology of our text, the course that you are set on has been determined by the Savior. Yes, amen. amen. It's been determined by him. It's not been determined by the wicked one or by the earth. It's been determined by Jesus. He's in control of all things. You believe that, don't you? I know that you do. Now, if that's the case, then whatever difficulty I face, he sent it to me. It doesn't matter what it is. Now, brethren, the wounds of a friend are faithful. If I'm being whipped by an enemy, it's hard to bear up under. But if I'm being whipped by someone that's faithful, a friend, it's a lot easier to take it, isn't it? If I'm bound and laying upon the altar and it's my father that's raising the knife, I can safely trust his hand. Right? This is so important to see this. We have got, we have got and if you haven't already, I, I don't mean to insult you if you have, but there is such a tendency in flesh to not realize that difficulty is first coming from the hand of Jesus before it comes through the instrumentality of of the enemy, the devil. Amen. He is a vassal, brother, and he is a vassal. He cannot do anything except what Jesus tells him to do. But it comes from the hand of the Savior. When you're looking at Jesus, you can see this. This is a marvelous truth. This has been very liberating to see this, and, and I need to see this even more clearly. But now, think of this. Job is in the midst of these horrible afflictions. He's been given no explanation by God. And what does he say? Though he slay me, Yet will I trust him. Hmm? He didn't credit it to the enemy. He didn't credit it. <laughs> he didn't credit it to those those people that came in and, and plundered. He, he didn't. He, he credited it to God. Though he slay me. In other words, he didn't know whether this was going to end in his death or not, but he was going to safely trust in the hand of the one he knew to be just and righteous in all his ways. Joseph did the same thing. What you meant for evil. God meant for good. He wasn't complaining about going through difficulties. Why? Because he was able to trace his difficulties back to the hand of the living God in whom he put his trust, his very life, trusted in him. Jesus did the same thing. There he was before Pilate. And what does he say? You would have no authority over me except it had been given you from above. Jesus could safely trust himself into the hand of God. See, we... We've got to learn this, to trace all difficulty back to Jesus. It will enable you to bear up under it much better, much better. See, <clears throat> Spurgeon one time said this. He said, it would be a very sharp and trying experience to me to think that I have an affliction which God never sent me, that the bitter cup was never filled by his hand, that my trial were never measured out by him, nor sent to me by his arrangement of their weight and quantity. He's the one who knows you best and knows what you can handle has sent the affliction. And he is the righteous one. And he's the one who wants you to finish your race. I'll tell you, if we can see it this way, this enables you to maintain your joy while going through difficulty. You can count it all joy that you've su suffered persecution for his name, suffered shame for his name. You can do that. Well, I'll tell you, there's so much to see in the face of Jesus. I just wanted to give you those couple of things. But Jesus does want us to finish this race. And there are difficulties associated with it. He well knows, brethren, he's the forerunner that has gone before us. There's no one better to assist us to get through this race than the one who's passed through it himself. And if we keep our eyes on him, he's going to lead us safely home. You're pilgrims and strangers. You're on the move. You're not made for this world. You're made for another. There's difficulty associated with us becoming the prepared people to abide forever with the living God. But just one day in those courts when we finally make it home and we sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at that great feast, the joy that you will experience there will drown out any sorrow you had here. So let's keep running, brethren. Thank you for your time.